Slow Burn Media and Bill Huffman present Who Killed, a podcast that provides a voice for the voiceless. I can't believe this stuff about Ken. I just plain do not believe it. Investigators poured their heart and soul into this case. I mean, they leave a little bit of themselves from what I've seen here. And uh, did a review of all the all the stuff that was there, evidence and, and the case file, and decided to send some of the the evidence materials in um, to the state crime lab for a review with the, the newer technology. And that's where we, we identified that there was some, some DNA. In 1956, 16-year-old Patty Kalitsky of Great Falls was raped and murdered. Her boyfriend, 18-year-old Malmstrom Airman Dwayne Vogel, was also killed. Detectives looked at 35 suspects, including crime boss James Whitey Bulger, who had been in the area and arrested for rape in 1951. Another suspect was Edward Wayne Edwards, the subject of a book by former Great Falls Police Detective John Cameron, who was linked to Lover's Lane murders in Ohio and Wisconsin. Wilson called Gould an ideal neighbor. He was an easygoing, soft-spoken, he didn't drink, he didn't raise cane, I never heard him cuss in my life. Just a real good man. We did do a lot of research and looking to see if there was any unsolved or homicides in relation to where he was at at certain times. Uh, we just were not able to find any. Our duty is to make sure that we solve these cases, um, solve them the best we can. Hello and welcome to episode 122 of Who Killed? I'm your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media Podcast. On this week's episode, we'll be taking a look at a few cases that have recently been solved with the ultimate crime fighter, genealogy DNA, or familial DNA. Uh, it's really nice to actually see a return of the Summer of Justice, as it seems like you can't go a day or two without hearing about a cold case being solved using this new technology. Now, of course, anybody familiar with familial DNA knows that this isn't brand new, but it has been something that I thought kind of slacked off last year. Now, granted, the summer of 2020 uh, just didn't seem as active as this summer as far as 2021 goes, but that could have easily been displaced by the pandemic and everything else just kind of got pushed to the side. So the bottom line is I'm very happy to see that these cases are being closed one after another. And you guys clearly know that I have a passion to see the Amy Mahalovic case solved, but it is still great to see these other families and communities reaching some sense of closure. I mean, if you Googled familial DNA last year, you would have been inundated with stories about the Golden State Killer. Now, if you Google the same thing, you're likely to find a string of recent arrests or cases being closed thanks to familial DNA technology. It is interesting to see, though, how people submit their DNA for fun and may end up discovering a sadistic murderer in their family. I'm pretty sure that probably wasn't the intention when these companies started, but once the toothpaste is out of the roll, how are you supposed to get it back in? So, to think that this all started with these databases is a little bewildering because, again, they voluntarily put their genes online. I have a lot of respect for the men and women who investigated these crimes and were able to save evidence for possible future use. It took a real forward-thinking mentality, since DNA wasn't used in a court case until the mid-1980s, to preserve evidence that may not be useful at the time, but they can look at and go, maybe one day we can use this. And again, that takes a certain type of officer or investigator who can see the big picture of things. Technology, okay, might not be where we want it to be today, but it may be where we want it to be tomorrow and or in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years or this first case that we talk about, 60 years. And the first case that I am going to be talking about is... 
the murder of 18-year-old airman Lloyd Dwayne Bogle and Patricia Kalitsky. Now, Lloyd was an 18-year-old, and he had already graduated high school, while Kalitsky was a high school junior. Now, according to the Associated Press in 1956, the <clears throat> two young Haver girls had told Sheriff R.C. Timmons that they were riding around with two airmen at Great Falls late on that Monday when they saw a man on the ground between a parked car and a tree. Now, this was what people consider a lover's lane type of place, and they really didn't think much of it. The county sheriff said the girls actually told him that they thought the man had passed out from drinking, and they did not investigate. But it was 11.30 a.m. the following day when Bogle's body was actually discovered. And the girls had told the officer that they saw this man on the ground between 11.30 p.m. and midnight. Now, there was an inquest in Great Falls that Wednesday night, and the coroner, C.E. Magner, had said that Bogle had probably died between 2 and 4 a.m. Tuesday. Now, he said the shooting could have been much earlier, probably between 10 p.m. and midnight on that Monday. The Great Falls Tribune reported, quote, The trail of a mad killer cooled tonight as authorities' best efforts failed to turn up a lead to the mysterious killing of an 18-year-old Texas airman and the girl he planned to marry. Now, one of the issues plaguing investigators, according to Under Sheriff John Earl, he said that a stiff wind the night of the shooting had actually blown sand over the tracks of the killer's car at the place where he was shot. And that was where late Lloyd Dwayne Bogle was laying. And again, the body of Patricia Kalitsky, who was blonde haired and blue eyes was actually discovered a day later on Wednesday in a ravine eight miles away. Quote, we are chasing down several leads, Earl said, but nothing new has developed. Now, of course, there were lots of questions to be asked at the Air Force Base, and that was Malmstrom Air, For or Air Force Base, where Lloyd Bogle had actually been a you know, airmen. And Sheriff DJ Leeper had said that the air police were questioning an airman who had allegedly argued with Bogle a few days before the shooting. But he said, unfortunately, quote, we are not holding anyone. And again, Leeper said there was little doubt that they were slain by the same person. Officials said the killer apparently carried out the executions in, and this is what they wrote back in the 1950s, in the Chinese manner. Each victim appeared to have been forced to kneel back to the killer and was shot behind the ear. The sheriff said that neither showed a sign of struggle, and he ruled out both sex and robbery as possible motives. Again, Patricia's body was fully clothed. An expensive camera, camera was actually found in Bogle's car. And then $5 in cash was on his body. Now again, $5 in cash would probably be like 50 bucks today. So why not take it? The pair had been dating for several months. And apparently they were last seen at a drive-in restaurant on that Monday night. Now, according to the girl's parents, uh... Mr. and Mrs. Henry Kalitsky had said that the couple had eloped when they failed to return Monday night. They thought that was the case. And unfortunately, their worst nightmares actually were about to come true. Now, Bogle was attached again to the Malmstrom Air Force Base, and he had been at Kalitsky's house during the Christmas holiday. And apparently, the day before, or the day of the murder, Mrs. Klitsky said that Bogle appeared so moody 
that she actually asked him about it. And she said that he replied with, quote, I've got the blues and I just can't shake them because of an argument he had with a buddy. Again, this goes back to what investigators were talking about at the Air Force Base with a particular airman who had been arguing, apparently, with Lloyd Bogle. And sheriff's officers and the Great Falls Police, as well as, again, the Air Force Base Police, basically kind of were left in the dark. I mean, they were unable to turn up any concrete clues as to the identity of the killer. And Sheriff Leeper basically told the press that we're giving full cooperation and not any person has been arrested. Now, a large number of airmen, again, were being questioned at the air base, and there was one brought to the county attorney's office and questioned by Leeper and county attorney R.V. Bottomley. Leeper went on to say that he had also been offered assistance from surrounding cities, other states, and the Royal Mounted Police in Canada. Again, county commissioners Thursday of that week emphasized reports are erroneous that they had ordered no autopsies to be performed without their consent. Chairman Otto Powell said, quote, it's not true. We have never interfered with the coroner's office or have we attempted to tell him what to do, unquote. And the commissioner explained, as long as Dr. Magner complies with the law, we have no argument. Powell pointed out that commissioners were bound by law in improving claims. Now, questioning, again, went all over the board. People questioned acquaintance, acquaintances of the girl. They questioned... Uh, you know, people at the Air Force Base, you know, pretty much officers did what you do in this type of situation where they start checking other cities to see if there's any similar incidents where, again, they could find a connection. But this is the 1950s, so there was no internet and communication wasn't as great as it is today, clearly. The technology just wasn't there again. One of the more peculiar things about this case that I find to be interesting is the fact that Patricia was found eight miles away and she was actually found at the bottom of a steep 20-foot embankment uh, or ravine and she had also been shot through the head and it, it appeared that after shooting the body she was either thrown over the bank or fell and again Indications are that both of the young people were forced to kneel before the killer or killers fired their fatal shots. The Great Falls Tribune reported that at the inquest in Bogle's death that the jury recommended an autopsy be made and Magner started the autopsy Thursday afternoon. He said Thursday night that the autopsy was continuing and x-rays would be taken. As yet, no trace of a bullet had been found. Now, the coroner had also scheduled an inquest for later that night in the death of the girl. A recommendation for another autopsy was expected. And again, the bullets that killed the couple have not been found, and authorities believe they were probably inside the victim's skulls. Now, Leeper had told the coroner's jury that recovery of the bullets might provide assistance in the investigation of the killings when a murderer or a weapon is located. He said, in an event such as this, they can make comparisons of the bullets. And Magner had said that the girl apparently had not been molested criminally, so she was at least spared the indignity of being assaulted. Unfortunately, she was murdered in replacement of that. I don't see that as a fair trade. And this, the FBI at this point in time in the 1950s uh, were available to help. Uh, the, girl, the girl's clothing was actually sent there to be studied and 
The coroner had believed that she was shot about an hour after Bogle and that her death occurred several several hours later. The young couple was last seen about 9 p.m. on that Monday night at a drive-in restaurant. And the girl's parents told authorities that Bogle uh, was pretty regular at the Kalitsky home and became what they said was, quote, one of the family. They said he had been slightly depressed, as I mentioned earlier, and seemed reluctant to return to the base, apparently because he was afraid. Now, again, there's a lot of speculation, and when you're investigating the crime that is so tragic and so fresh that it really needs to be dealt with, it's uh, it's easy to see why they jump to these conclusions. Now, again, they had received information that Bogle had been in a fight with an airman at Vaughn several weeks ago. Uh, they indicated the fight had been about a girl. Put two and two together, you know, there's a lot of reasons why they ran with this. And they said that authorities were checking all the possibilities that the brutal murders may have been committed by a spurned suitor of the girl. And again, an abandoned car was found on the Belt Highway on that Thursday, and the highway patrol had it towed to Great Falls. It was later noticed that there was a bullet hole in the door, and this is when the sheriff was notified. Now, the sheriff said Thursday of that week that it might be a clue, but his officers and police had not had a chance to check it out thoroughly. And again, no one was being held at the time of at this time, and the slaying of these two individuals really was just kind of blowing in the wind. I mean, the investigation was really running into brick walls. Uh, I mean, he said that some of the people that he questioned, you know, might turn up to be linked to other crimes. But again, it's just unfortunate that at that time and place, people aren't necessarily thinking about who could have done this and what could have led to somebody being uh, as vindictive as willing to commit this murder. Again, the big thing about cases like this is like you have the car with a bullet in it and it's a red herring because they were unable to prove that it had any connection to the murders. Harland McDonough told the Tribune, you know, he was a deputy sheriff in charge of the Identification Bureau and he reported that the owner had been located and it definitely had been proved the car had been in the location from which it was ordered towed by the highway patrol several days before the two young people were killed. And again, this is what they described in the paper as a Chinese execution. Again, like I said, this is what reporters were writing about in the 1950s. I don't believe that expression would be used in this day and age but I just want to give you the context of what people were thinking. I don't know if they were, or they just thought this was just a good way to describe something, but either way, it doesn't really fit the PC culture we kind of live in these days. This week's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh, pre-portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. This summer, HelloFresh is here to take the work out of eating well. Reach your goals with delicious, calorie-smart, and protein-smart lunch and dinner options, plus new vegan recipes, too. HelloFresh makes entertaining easy with a selection of crowd-pleasing eats, like their bratwurst bar with caramelized onions, Dijonese slaw, and pineapple relish, or a snack board with pretzel bites, spiced bar nuts, and hot honey peach jam. So go to HelloFresh.com slash WhoKilled16 and use the code WhoKilled16 for 16 free meals plus 
free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash WhoKilled16 and use WhoKilled16 for 16 meals plus free shipping. And I would just say, blankly, there are a lot of executions that go on that do not involve the Chinese. And I question that whole line of uh, reasoning there. But anyway... Back to this crazy story. I mean, you have Lloyd, and you have Patricia, and you have this cute little couple in Montana who are out on a date and decide to go to Lover's Lane and, you know, 18, 16, 1950s, go with it, you know? You just kind of can figure out exactly what was going on we can think about cases like the zodiac killer where he killed people in similar situations uh at least in the first killing and then yeah i mean multiple killings and then you got son of sam he was also one of those people that would kill couples that were in their cars so you get a lot of this Weird stuff. I mean, like, you have that incel movement that's going on right now, which is scary as hell, and don't get involved with it if you have any brains at all. It's like, don't go down the cue hole. Just saying, probably not a good idea if you want to be a smart person. And this is where you kind of are left holding the bag, really. I mean, these young people had their lives stolen out from under them. And according to Sergeant Fred Perry's, he said, we've questioned a lot of people and gathered a lot of information. Now we just hope some of it will help us lead to the killer. And he said, it either appears that the killer was very lucky or planned it very carefully. Now, again, This just sucks to be in this situation because it doesn't make any sense, you know? I mean, there aren't any answers. And so when you have a case where you have this type of disaster, tragedy, uh, you call it whatever you want, but it's a tragedy for the community, it's a tragedy for the families of of the Kalitsky family, the Bogle family, it's just, it's brutal. And then it's also brutal on the town of Great Falls and in all these situations and with almost all unsolved murders some reward money is raised and according to the AP rewards for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the killer or killers of Patricia Kalitsky and Lloyd Dwayne Bogle had passed the $1,000 mark on Friday as law enforcement agencies consolidated their efforts to track down this vicious slayer. Now, this is reading verbatim from the Great Falls Tribune. An inquest into the death of the Great Falls High School junior, who was the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Henry Kalitsky, was conducted Friday night, and the coroner's jury ordered an autopsy as in the case of her slain boyfriend. Again, we talked about that earlier. And the county coroner called no witnesses at the inquest, but delivered his own report to the jury. Now, he placed the time of death of the girl as early Tuesday morning, seven miles north of Great Falls. Cause of death? Gunshot wound from the same weapon of which the caliber was not known. The girl's fully clothed body was, again, found by a county patrol operator two days after, well, it was, I guess it was one day after Bogle's body was found. And it was because it was Tuesday morning when he was found lying beside his car. Again, the coroner jury returned a verdict which said, we the jury feel the gunshot wound that caused the death was fired by a person or persons unknown. Due to the similarity of circumstances, time, and association of this death and the death of Lloyd D. Bogle, we feel an autopsy should be done to help complete the investigation and aid in the prosecution. 
Now, two police detectives had been assigned permanently to assess, assist the investigation. And again, no new leads were uncovered during the day. And pretty much every available man working on the case was trying to find answers and bring closure to the family and the community. The entire police, the state police network was alerted and was co cooperating and checking clues in their communities. Contributions to the reward fund were being made by Great Northern employees. I mean, this was this was a big deal, you know? I mean, it this was a this was a case where somebody had gone into a very low key private area and snuffed out the lives of two young individuals. And, you know, it's just really hard to accept that this poor couple were just in the wrong place at the wrong time when really that's what it boils down to. I mean, this is really just tragedy and wrapped up in a nutshell. I mean, it's it's just wild to think that you have all the officers, you have the Canadian Mounted Police, you have the uh, FBI offering help, you have the state police helping. It is a full-on effort to find the killer of these two people. The police and local investigators would have to wait in agonizing six and a half decades before they had any answers for what they were looking for. And thank you to Forensic Familial Genealogy, because 65 years later, the Bogle and Kalitsky murders were solved using that exact technology. And the Great Falls Tribune reporter Tracy Rosenbaum wrote, quote, a double homicide of two teens has been solved after more than 60 years thanks to forensic genealogy. The Cascade County Sheriff's Office announced on Tuesday that it has closed the file on the 1956 double homicide of Patricia Kalitsky and Lloyd Dwayne Bogle, resolving the 65-year-old case. Through the use of DNA testing, unavailable at the time of the killings and decades of investigation, CCSO has now concluded that Great Falls native Kenneth Gold, now deceased, more than likely committed the murders. Detective Sergeant John Cadner, who took the case over in 2012, said it was the oldest case he could find nationwide to be solved using forensic genealogy. As we mentioned before, it was on January 3rd when three boys hiking along the Sun River had discovered Bogle dead near his car, and it was a day later when Kalitsky's body was found off of Vineyard Ro Road in that was no actually north of Great Falls, and again, both were shot. Now, Bogle's hands were bound behind his back, and this was with his own belt, but his valuables and money were not stolen. And another odd thing is his car was actually on and in gear, but the mer emergency brake was actually on. So, kind of an odd situation there. Where you had Kalitsky, you know, again, she was only 16, and she was born in Great Falls, and she was just a junior at the Great Falls High School. And, again, like I mentioned before, Bogle was a Mal Malmstrom Air Force Base Airman from Waco, Texas. And while stationed at Malmstrom, he became smitten with Kalitsky, and that is quote-unquote smitten from the Great Falls Tribune. The two had even begun talking about marriage. Now again, this is 65 years later that we're talking about it, but leads surfaced and dried up throughout the immediate investigation, and law enforcement had multiple suspects, including notorious gangster James Joseph Whitey Bulger. Now that is a shocker, because... We all know my connection to Whitey Bulger, and that is through Phil, Phil Torsney, the one and only fabulous FBI investigator, former Rapid Team Response leader, and investigator of the Amy Mahalovic case. But he was the one that did help bring in Whitey. So, 
It is very interesting to see why he would be brought up in this particular case. But, uh, hey, hey, you never know. So, Phil Matt- Madison uh, started working in the evidence room in 1988, and he is a CCSO detective. And when he was looking through the Kalitsky bogle evidence, it was interesting. So, in 2001, as a detective, he actually sent a microscope slide of a vaginal swab gathered from Kalitsky's body to the Montana Crime Lab for analysis. Now, the swab was actually a standard procedure for autopsies in 1956, which, hey, in 1956, that's pretty forward thinking. The lab actually found a sperm cell that did not belong to Bogle. Now, this part is disappointing because throughout the story, you're thinking, okay, well, she wasn't sexually assaulted. Well, guess what? If they found a sperm cell inside for a vaginal swab, then that throws all of that out the window. And yes, this woman was unfortunately had the worst end of her life. It's just terrible. And again, at the time, you know, there were about 35 suspects that came and went, they say, and law enforcement took the DNA sample that they had and compared them to other men, ruling them out one by one. And Madison actually left the CCSO and had pretty much given up on the case. He said that, quote, a lot of different people had a turn at this and we just weren't able to take it to conclusion, he said. I think it's opened, it opens up a whole new door for working old cases and also just goes to show you how important the initial evidence gathering is in all these cases. That goes back to what I was saying about having forward-thinking investigators at the time of this murder. Again, 1956, they didn't know what the hell they were doing. I mean, you had finger fingerprints, and that's about it. And maybe blood type, maybe. Now, the case did that made everybody, and you, the listener, me, the podcaster, aware of this fabulous technology i mean we may have been aware of it but the biggest story clearly is the arrest of uh joseph james d'angelo you know the golden state killer and again he was the pretty much i think the first well it was the bit he was at least the biggest name connected through forensic genealogy and in 2019 detectives actually worked with Bode technology to perform some more tests on the DNA evidence that was found on Kalitsky's body. They were actually able to upload the sample to a voluntary genealogical database where they discovered a possible familial connection. Ding, ding, ding. Tracing that family's tree led investigators to suspect Gould, a man born and raised in Great Falls. Now, Gould was born August 23rd, 1927, and died May 31st, 2007. So this guy got to live 80 years if he committed this murder. I mean, that's just, yeah, that's just not fair. And according to his death certificate, Gould died in an Oregon County in Oregon County, Missouri, and that would have put him about 29 when these murders happened. So, Kander had gone on to say that Gould had been cremated, so he had to reach out to Gould's surviving children and ask for samples to verify the match. Now, this is a reporting from the Great Falls Tribune. Quote, I wasn't sure how they were going to react when I come to them saying, Hey! Your dad's a suspect in this case, but actually they were great to work with, unquote. Now, Kadner had been working this case, so he was very excited about this break. Now, Gold's family home was located a little over a mile from where the Kalitsky family lived, and he was known to ride horses throughout the area. Now, again, according to the Great Falls Tribune, Gould was 24 when he married 16-year-old 
Lulu Bell Brown in 1952. Well, coincidentally, after the murders, Gold sold his property to, in Tracy. His family lived in Geraldine and Hamilton before moving to Missouri in 1967. They never returned to Montana. Gould did not have a known criminal history and was actually never interviewed during the murder investigation. And investigators could not uncover any connection between him and the victims. Well, okay, I understand that they can't connect him to the victims, but again, he lived a mile from where Kalitsky lived. She was blonde. She was a teenager. He was 29. I'm just saying, if he saw something he liked, there's no reason to think that that would have been the motive right then and there. I mean, if you look at the history of this guy, the Tribune actually went through and they looked at their own database and see if his name popped up. And it was actually... On June 8, 1943, when Gould was 15, he was reported missing after he left his grandmother's home in Buffalo and could not be located. He was found a week later working at a ranch at Arrow Creek, about 60 miles away. I mean, I would say that uh, that's a pretty uh, precocious teenager, and uh, that's a bold move. Now, in 1960, Gold's four-year-old daughter, she was born a month before the murders. She actually died of a short illness, so that sucks. But mostly for the mother, not for this killer. And again, it's just so wild to think that these cases can go on for so long and these detectives can work these cases for so many years and you know, they all have the shared same feelings. It's really amazing. And it's just like, how do you answer the question of what keeps a case like this alive? And the best answer comes from, you know, Kadner. And he says, I think if you just look at the circumstances, you had two young vibrant individuals that were well-liked among their peer group. Investigators poured their heart and soul into this case. They leave a little bit of themselves from what I've seen. Quite frankly, that's our duty. Our duty is to make sure that we solve these cases. Now, the other case that I found to be very interesting is the 49-year-old cold case murder of Julie Ann Hansen of Naperville. Now, Hansen was 15 of Naperville, Illinois, when she vanished on Jan July 7th, 1972, on a beautiful summer day. Now, her parents, Jerome and Marguerite Hansen, had reported her missing when she had failed to return home. As things could be worse, or couldn't be worse, her bike was actually discovered on a gravel road off of 87th Street and Knock Knolls Road. That is brutal. Her body was found in a nearby cornfield during a search of the area. An investigator said at the time that Hansen had been sexually assaulted and stabbed 36 times. And that was according to the Chicago Sun-Times. Again, I'm going to get into that case a little bit more next week because it's a little bit more interesting in the sense that it was 49 years, 49 years. Um, and this was in a very highly populated suburb of Chicago and a wealthy suburb nonetheless. So it will be interesting to discuss the 
murder of Julie Ann Hansen, as well as the eventual conclusion of her case. But I do appreciate you guys tuning in this week to hear me talk about the murders of Patricia Kalitsky and Lloyd Dwayne Bogle. Again, these were two young people who were in the prime of their lives and talking about getting married and were literally shot down from their lives by some stranger that they didn't know. Again, due to technology and the unwillingness to give up, this case actually was brought to a head. So, we can only hope that more cases continue to be solved using this technology and the court cases that come from these investigations will hopefully go smoothly and we will see guilty pleas and not a lot of taxpayer dollars being spent on actual trials because, again, DNA doesn't lie. And you can fake DNA if you wanted to, but at a scene, but that's a whole nother thing that's planning evidence that's not, you know, you know, when you're one in a trillion or one in a billion or you blah, 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 yeah, you kind of paint it into a corner. So I want to say kudos to the investigators of Great Falls and the investigators who had the wherewithal to send the evidence in to be tested. I mean, who's thinking about a 65-year-old case. But boy, I tell you what, I'm sure the families are very thrilled and the town of Great Falls is probably ecstatic. And again, thank you to technology and science for leading the way in this new era of crime fighting. It really is something that I think has become the ultimate weapon. And it will be something used for a long time until the next great technology is uncovered. But until then, you can count on a lot of cases being closed. So thank you guys so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Who Killed? And please stay tuned next week as we discuss the murder of Julie Ann. Hansen. So thank you guys so much again for tuning in to this week's episode of Who Killed? As you know, I drop new episodes every Friday, wherever you get your favorite podcasts. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, as well as my other shows, you can directly help support the shows by clicking on the link in the show notes. Or you can contribute to the show via the Venmo app with my username at Bill-Huffman-3. Again, I appreciate all the contributions. Everybody has been amazing. Thank you to all of you who have contributed. Every contribution, big or small, really does make a difference. So you can help support the show with a donation or you can leave a five-star review because that also helps keep the cases that I cover in the spotlight. And if you want to stay up to date on some of the cases that I've covered, as well as the new shows that are coming down the pipeline, always follow me on Twitter at BillHuffman3. Thank you so much again, listening listeners. Until next time, be healthy and stay safe. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not, it's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased, and essential world news daily. 
3 a.m. The comedy horror podcast that holds weekly gatherings around the campfire. Let me tell you what you're going to get. You're going to hear stories about demonic possessions, prison stabbings, skinwalkers, glitches in the matrix, cult leaders, missing 411, night marchers, Operation Paperclip, Mesopotamian devil worship, and so many monsters it'll give Kanye West a runaway for his money. Pop and meme culture also aren't off topic. A camp where laughs and scares are constantly competing for first place. We're just a group of friends trying to bust each other's balls, find the best stories, and expand the circle in the process. 3 a.m., the comedy horror podcast, not for the faint or fragile of heart. Let's go.